We've been building our understanding of fatigue, and now we're ready to tackle mean stress corrections. Thus far, we have imagined that we have a time-dependent stress field, which is cyclic and with zero mean stress. So the stress amplitude fully reversed would just be this value right there, and uh, the mean stress is zero. But as we move forward in this, we want to be able to consider the possibility of stresses like this where the mean stress is greater than zero. The first thing we have to do is characterize the stress field. We want to characterize the load, and so we're going to look at the maximum stress and the minimum stress, and we're going to say that the stress amplitude is just one half the max minus the minimum, and the mean stress is just one half the max plus the minimum stress. And then what we want to do is look at, as we vary the mean stress, how the lifetime changes. So there are a huge number of experiments out there that show the following. So as we vary the stress amplitude and the mean stress, there's a couple of things that we have to put in here. First, we want to look at zero mean stress. That is all of our sigma AR stress amplitudes. And we also know that if the mean stress is equal to the ultimate, we cannot apply any stress amplitude to it. It breaks. And so uh, there were a number of experiments that were conducted where they plotted what are called constant life diagrams. They look at all of the combinations of mean stress and stress amplitude for which we get 10 to the 6 cycles to failure, and they get a curve that looks like that. And then they look at, well, what happens if we increase the stress amplitude so that we get 10 to the 5th cycles to failure? We get a curve that looks like so. They have to converge when the mean stress is equal to the ultimate. And then if we look at 10 to the 4th cycles, for instance, we would get something like this. So the number of cycles to failure being 10 to the fourth. And that may look a little bit odd, but what you do is for each of these cases, you identify the fully reversed stress amplitude associated with them, and you divide all of those stress amplitudes by the fully reversed stress amplitude. So we take this plot and we transform it into a normalized plot where plot the stress amplitude divided by the fully reversed stress amplitude amplitude versus the mean stress divided by the ultimate tensile strength. And if you do that, so if we plot sigma m divided by sut, we're going to have 1 here. We're still going to have the line where we have 0 mean stress. We're going to have sigma a over sigma a r here. And it turns out that all of those curves collapse onto a single master curve. So all the life curves collapse onto a single curve. So we got tensile mean stresses to the right of zero. We have compressive mean stresses to the left of zero. That the, and so the first thing that everyone tried to do is to determine a simple way of handling the mean stress. So they drew a straight line like so, and they drew a, drew a straight line like that. So what this means is we are going to ignore sigma m less than zero. So we're going to ignore compressive stresses. They seem to increase the allowable stress amplitudes a bit for the same lifetimes, but not by very much. So the safe thing to do is to just ignore the compressive mean stress relation. So I'm going to plot sigma m over the ultimate again. I'm going to put one here. I'm going to put zero mean stress now along the y-axis, and this is going to be my sigma a over sigma a r. That's going to be one there. And so if I write an equation for this, I get that sigma a over sigma a r is equal to one minus sigma m over the ultimate tensile strength. So this becomes the equation of this line, and this is called the Goodman equation. So Goodman equation incorporates the mean stress, so Goodman equation allows us to include the effect of tensile mean stresses. So that's just sigma m greater than zero. You might not appreciate why any of this matters, but the Goodman equation allows the calculation of the number of cycles to failure for complicated stress distributions that include non-zero mean stresses. How do we do that? We look at the fully reversed stress amplitude in Baskin's Law, where that stress amplitude is related to the number of cycles to failure through these constants A and B. Now, we then look at the Goodman mean stress correction, where we take the stress amplitude, divide it by sigma AR, and we know that the equation 
that describes this is 1 minus the mean stress over the ultimate tensile strength. So if I take that sigma AR to the other side of the equation, I get this right here. So in effect, what I have done is related a stress amplitude with a non-zero mean to a fully reversed stress amplitude. And now I can replace that fully reversed stress amplitude using Baskin's law, and that then would allow me to solve for the number of cycles to failure if I knew the stress amplitude and the mean stress. That's an important finding. But the other thing that's important is this ratio of sigma A to sigma AR is for any fully reversed stress amplitude. If we were looking at fully reversed stress amplitudes associated with the endurance limit, we would replace sigma AR with the endurance strength, and that then would tell us the equivalent combination of stress amplitude and mean stress that would give us infinite life this Goodman line in here, you will note that usually what we're trying to do is look at the stress amplitude and the mean stress. So we're looking at a combination of stress amplitude and mean stress where we're, we're trying to ensure infinite life. So instead of plotting sigma A over sigma A R, we let that be equal to the endurance limit that we calculate. And so we end up with a plot of our stress amplitude divided by endurance limit and our mean stress divided by our ultimate strength. So when we're to the right of zero, we're looking at the mean stress divided by the ultimate strength and tension. And when we are to the left of zero, we have compressive mean stresses. We normalize that mean stress by the ultimate strength and compression, and it can be different. So this shows a bunch of experimental data on top of this Goodman line right here, and shows that if we just truncate and put a horizontal line in compression, it's not too far off. We're way conservative out here in the tensile region because our experimental data allows for slightly larger stress amplitudes than the Goodman line would predict, but the Goodman line is a pretty safe bet. Now there's another thing we do, and that is we usually just look at the tensile part of this curve, and so we have a tendency to plot the stress amplitude on the y-axis, the mean stress on the x-axis. We identify the ultimate tensile strength and we identify the endurance strength. And then the book just says, well, let's not use sigmas. Let's go ahead and use SA as stress amplitude and SM as the mean stress. Draw a straight line between the endurance strength and the ultimate tensile strength. And this becomes the Goodman line. Well, you'll note that we said that a lot of the data lies above the Goodman line. And so we're, there was a huge amount of effort that went into modifying these mean stress correction factors. And so there is a correction factor where Gerber introduced a parabola. I should draw that in a different color. So Gerber introduced a parabola, so it becomes the Gerber mean stress correction factor, which is a little bit different than the Goodman, which is a simple straight line. The other thing is people started to think, well, why don't we also, why don't we include the yield strength? Remember, the endurance strength has got to be less than the yield strength, and the yield strength is also less than the ultimate. So Langer said, well, why why don't we just draw a simple yield line connecting the yield stress along the amplitude axis to the yield stress along the mean stress axis. That becomes what's called the Langer line, and that checks for yield failure upon the first cycle. Well, the ASME, not to be outdone, decided that they would draw, come up with a simple elliptic equation where they would connect the endurance limit on the stress amplitude axis to the yield strength on the mean stress axis, and they identified what's called the ASME elliptic equation right there, all of which become mean stress correction factors, by the way. So we have the Gerber line, we have the Goodman line, we have the ASME elliptic, the good one, Goodman is the one that most people use because it's simple and easy to understand. But there's another one called the Soderberg line, which goes in here. It connects the endurance limit to the yield strength. Soderberg, I guess not to be outdone by anyone else, said I can come up with something even more conservative. And so there are different factors of safety that are associated with operating down in a range below any one of these lines. So any 
pair sigma a sigma m in here, and the book says s a s m. If you're below the line, you're going to last forever. You're, go you're not going to exceed the endurance strength of the material. And so now what you have to do is come up with equations that describe these lines and the factors of safety if you lie somewhere below any one of those lines. So we want to find fatigue factors of safety NF for each of these lines. So the factors of safety lines that are drawn up there, other than the Langer line, are shown in equation 645 through 648. The Soderberg equation, where this N is gonna be the factor of safety. The Goodman equation, where that's the factor of safety. The Gerber, where the factor of safety is buried in here, so you'd have to extract it. ASME elliptic, it's buried in here, relatively easy to extract. And then to prevent yield, we go to the yield failure criterion presented by Langer, where we simply add the stress amplitude and the mean stress. We take the yield strength and divide that by the stress amplitude plus mean stress, and that becomes a factor of safety to protect against yield. So whenever you're doing these sorts of problems, you need to identify the maximum stress, the minimum stress, so that you could then calculate the stress amplitude and the mean stress. You need to determine if we have yield, so check yield, use Langer to do that. Then you want to check for infinite life using one of the criteria and find out if your factor of safety for fatigue is greater than or equal to one. If you have infinite life, you don't have to worry anymore. But if you don't have infinite life, you have to calculate the cycles to fail it. Failure. So those are all the steps that we must take, and these are perfectly good steps to take in a spreadsheet program. So what you want to put into your spreadsheets, which you've already sorted out, is entry points so you can enter the maximum and minimum stress that allows you then to calculate the stress amplitude and mean stress. Then you want to check for yield using the Langer criterion, and then you want to calculate your factors of safety. You want to calculate your Goodman factor of safety using this equation right here, where you take your stress amplitude and divide by the endurance limit, add your mean stress divided by the ultimate. One over that will give you the factor of safety. You calculate the factor of safety using the Gerber criterion using this equation here. You calculate the factor of safety using ASME elliptic using this equation here. Relatively straightforward stuff to do and easily implementable in your spreadsheet programs. The last thing that we will have to do, which we'll do, we will do in the next lecture, is we have to account for stress concentration factors. That's important because stress concentration factors drive the local stress magnitude up and will end up being locations where you have to find sigma A and sigma M incorporating SCFs. So the rub is this. You know that you can go to uh, tables and calculate elastic stress concentration factors, which are perfectly good to use for fatigue calculations. It's a conservative estimate, but we have to sort out in the next lecture how we can find fatigue stress concentration factors, which are related to elastic stress concentration factors through something called notch sensitivity. Now, it's a really empirical thing, but we will go through it and show you how to calculate stress concentration factors. You already know that the tensile stress concentration factors will be different from the shear stress concentration factors, and notch sensitivities in both tension and shear will be different as well. We will talk about those next time.